talking on scaphoid fractures and the treatment options in the acute and non-union settings. Starting with just a little bit of history, the scaphoid uh, was named after scaphos, which is the Greek word for boat, because back in the day they thought the scaphoid bone looks like a boat. It's a um, highly articular bone with about 75% of its surface area being covered by articular cartilage for um, joints uh, within, for carpal joints as well as for articulation with the proximal radius. The scaphoid tubercle is palpable over the palmar surface of the hand and provides attachment for some of the ligaments as well as the waist which is highlighted there in blue is one of the most common sites of scaphoid fractures. Looking at the blood supply of the scaphoid, um, because of its highly articular nature there are limited points of entry for blood supply and so the majority of the blood supply comes from the dorsal carpal branch, which is a branch of the radial artery. This enters the scaphoid on the dorsal surface at the distal pole and, and supplies the proximal pole of the scaphoid by a retrograde blood flow. So essentially the proximal pole gets an end artery to supply it. And so in terms of fractures where the blood flow is compromised, there is no, um, there's no other anastomosis and so the proximal pole is highly susceptible to AVN. And there's also a minor blood supply from the superficial palmar arch, uh, arch, which is a branch of the volar radial artery, and this enters the distal tubercle and again only supplies the distal 20% of the scaphoid. Scaphoid has extrinsic as well as intrinsic ligaments. Uh, looking at the volar aspect of the extrinsic ligaments, there's the radioscaphocapitate ligament which runs from the radial styloid to the capitate and it creates a sort of a sling to support the waist of the scaphoid. It's important specifically to preserve this ligament at time of a proximal row carpectomy, which I'll talk about later, to stabilize the wrist joint. Uh, there's also the dorsal intercarpal and radioscaphoid ligaments on the dorsal side of the, um, of the hand and the wrist. Looking at the intrinsic ligaments, the most important one is the scapholunate ligament, which is the primary stabilizer of the scapholunate joint. And um, I pointed to it with that black line on the top picture. Disruption of this in an unstable scaphoid fracture can lead to lunate extension when the scaphoid flexes. So essentially the lunate will move independent to the distal pole of the scaphoid. This leads to a humpback deformity uh, as well as dorsal intercalated segmental instability or dizzy, which I'll mention later. So... Uh, scaphoid is the most frequently fractured carpal bone um, and up to about 15% of acute wrist injuries have a scaphoid fracture associated with it. And as I mentioned, the most common site of fracture is the waist with about 65% um, of fractures having a waist fracture. The proximal third, if fractured, has about a one-third rate of avascular necrosis. And the distal third account for only 10% of fractures in the adult population, but because of the type of ossification is the most common location in pediatric patients. Typically, uh, these fractures occur when there's axial loading across a hyperextended and radially deviated wrist joint. So it's a fracture in young active um, sport players, typically, and older pa patient will, uh, is more likely to fracture their wrist joint rather than a scaphoid distal radius. Uh, on examination, there's tenderness over the anatomical snuff box, and there's also pain when the first MCP joint is axially loaded onto the radius, so pushing the thumb onto the distal radius. Imaging can be tricky, and diagnosis of scaphoid fractures is quite difficult. Uh, typically, starting with x-rays, there are four views that we ask for, the AP and lateral of the scaphoid, the 45 degree pronation view is good to identify proximal pole fractures and a scaphoid view which is 30 degree extension and 20 degree ulnar deviation is good to assess for scaphoid waist fractures. If x-ray imaging is negative but there's high clinical suspicion then the recommendation is to repeat the x-ray in 7 to 14 days. Um, interestingly I found that bone scan can diagnose occult fractures at about 72 hours and it has a really high specificity with about 98%. We don't really use that in our health service, but um, in a patient with high index of suspicion, it might be useful to use it for. Uh, MRI is also very sensitive. Uh, 
especially in heat setting at less than 24 hours. It's useful because it, um, you can assess the vascularity of the proximal pole as well as any, any ligamentous injuries uh, in addition to identifying the fractures. CT is less effective than bone scan and MRI to diagnose occult fractures, but if in a patient who might progress on to need a surgery, it's useful to assess the location of the fracture, the amount of displacement, the size of the fragments, and down the line it's also good to assess progression to union and non-union. Looking at the management of acute fractures, um, as with anything in orthopaedics, as conservative management. Indications for this is in early diagnosis and therefore early mobilization of the fracture site and the wrist, in undisplaced fractures of less than one millimeter, and in a low demand patient, so non-dominant hand in an older patient who typically works at, works a desk job, doesn't really play much sport. I looked at whether an above elbow cast versus a below elbow cast or a thumb spiker is better. This was a study published in the Hand Journal of America in 2008. It looked at six cadaveric specimens with scaphoid fractures and the contralateral hand was used as a control. They found that there was no significant difference in movement at the fracture site between the types of cast, but there was a significant difference between no cast versus any cast. And looking at another um, study that was published in the Bone and Joint Journal, the, look, it was a prospective randomized control study looking at 392 patients. They found that there was no difference in the non-union rate between below elbow cast and a thumb spiker cast. And finally, there was another prospective randomized control study published in the Bone and Joint Journal, which looked at a below elbow cast with the patient immobilized at 20 degrees of wrist flexion versus 20 degrees of wrist extension. They found that although there were no difference in the union rates, at the six month mark, the patients who were immobilized in extension had better range of movement. Moving on to surgical management of the acute fracture, um, the indications for this is a late diagnosis. So if the scaphoid in the wrist joint is not immobilized in the first four weeks, up to 88% of patients progress on to non-union, even if the fracture is undisplaced. And a displaced fracture of more than one millimeter is an indication for surgery. And if the scaphoid has a humpback or rotational deformity, as I've shown in the x-rays there. So on the lateral projection, if the intra-scaphoid angle is more than 45 degrees, or the height to length ratio of the scaphoid is more than 0.65, which is the scaphoid looks more like a square rather than a long peanut, then um, the deformity, um, those are indications for surgical fixation. And a soft indication would be an elite athlete or a manual laborer if it's their dominant hand and they want to get back to sports or work early. The key points in surgical management is that because the majority of the blood supply comes from the dorsum of the scaphoid, a ventral approach is less likely to compromise the blood supply, but it does provide poor visualization of the proximal pole and disruption of the volocarpal ligaments. And because the scaphoid is a highly articular bone, less interruption to the cartilage and joints um, is better, and therefore if the metal weight is buried, such as in a headless compression screw, that's better for the joints around the scaphoid. So looking at the literature, um, the evidence points to headless compression screws with union rates up to 100%. Currently, uh, I couldn't find any evidence for superiority of vascular bone grafting or plating in the acute um, setting for scaphoid fractures. Moving on to non-union, this is de defined as no signs of healing at six months. Delayed union or uh, likely progression to non-union can be identified at about two to three months if there's no signs of callus on imaging. Symptoms of the patient's report with non-union is pain, decreased grip and pinch strength, and wrist stiffness, especially with extension and radial deviation. Imaging modalities can show radiocarpal arthritis or avascular necrosis of the proximal pole. I looked at a systematic review published in the Journal of Hand Surgery, which looked at 48 publications with 1,600 patients that met the eligibility criteria, and they concluded that vascularized bone grafts were superior to non-vascularized bone graft uh, to uh, provide union, with 92% progressing to union with vascularized bone graft. They also found that distal radius and iliac crest bone grafts had similar union rates, but harvesting of the iliac crest bone graft had more complications, therefore the suggestion was to use distal radius bone graft when possible. Any fixation had a higher incidence of union than no fixation at all, 
um, but no type of fixation was superior. Um, there was another article published in the same journal which looked at scaphoid plate fixation and a vascularized bone graft for really hard to fix scaphoid non-unions. They looked at nine patients with non-union who had previously had failed surgery in the acute setting, had a long duration of non-union with an average time of about 15 months, and uh, some had signs of proximal pole avascular necrosis. They used vascularized bone grafts with a volar buttress plate and they found that eight of the nine patients who had previously failed surgery did progress onto union. However, three of the patients reported clicking with the plate and they were um, to go on to have removal of metal layer down the line. Now the study looked at the rotational stability um, of scaphoid fractures with different types of fixation. This was a cadaveric study. Uh, it looked at single screw versus two screws versus a plate. And they found that two screws or a plate had significantly better rotational stability than a single screw, but there was no difference between using two screws versus a plate. There are also a few novel approaches that have been described in the literature, um, not really big patient populations, but I thought it was interesting. One is dorsal plating of unstable scaphoid fractures um, versus volar plating. So they found that there was high progression to union in an unstable fracture with dorsal plating because it provided dynamic compression using the tension side of the scaphoid. And also, it, um, it mitigated the need for bone grafting. There's also one study that looked at Ilizara fixation for scaphoid non-unions. Um, it looked 20 patients with non-union at about 14 months. It was a very novel approach. I just uh, came across it. Um, it was patients with humpback deformities, carpal instability, and AVN. All of them were excluded, so it was purely um, a scaphoid non-union. Uh, they found that at application of the Lizara frame with compression over five days and then immobilization for eight weeks um, provided 100% union with good outcomes on proms at about the six month mark. It was only one center, couldn't see anything. Um, Do you have a picture of that frame? No, I don't. Um, and so the uh, complications of non-union, one is scaphoid non-union advanced collapse, uh, which is seen in chronic scaphoid non-union, uh, leading to arthritis of the wrist because of collapse of the carpal bones. There's uh, three stages, starting with just arthrosis, which is localized to the radial side of the scaphoid and the radial styloid, progressing on to scaphoid capitate arthrosis, and then um, arthritis all around the scaphoid. Uh, in medically frail and low functioning patients, there's conservative management, which is just pain relief and splint for comfort. Whereas most patients do end up having surgery, especially if they're in the stage two and three. Three different types of surgeries for different indications. The first one being proximal row carpectomy. The advantage of this is that it eliminates pain. However, the disadvantage is that it reduces wrist motion and grip strength. And if the capitate head shows degenerative changes, it's not suitable. So this is not really used for patients who are manual laborers or it's their dominant hand in a young patient because we want to maintain their strength. Um, full corner fusion is good because it retains about 60% of wrist motion and 80% of grip strength, but the disadvantage is that the pain may persist. Um, and finally, an arthrodesis is used for a patient who doesn't really mind not having strength in that wrist. Uh, all they want is their pain to be eliminated. Um, and obviously the disadvantage is that there's no motion, but it is fused in a position of function, so they can use the wrist and the hand a little bit. Uh, dorsal intercalated segmental instability um, is due to scaphoid-lunate ligament disruption. This causes dissociation between the scaphoid and the lunate, um, and uh, therefore the mechanics of the radiocarpal joint is disrupted. So on imaging, um, there's two signs that you typically see. One is a signet ring sign of the scaphoid, which um, just shows that the scaphoid is highly um, unstable and malaligned. And the Terry Thomas sign, which is on to the right there, um, which shows scaphoid widening of more than three millimeters. The treatment at the stage of just a pure dizzy is for scaphoid ligament repair or a scaphoid orif if it's an unstable fracture to try and minimize the risk of this progressing onto a slack wrist, which is scaphoid advanced collapse. Uh, there's three Watson stages and a fourth one has been described as well, but was, is not part of the um, original definition. The first one in the bottom left-hand corner there 
is arthritis purely between the scaphoid and the radial styloid. Then it progresses on to stage two, where the entire um, radial fossa of the wrist of the distal radius and the scaphoid, there's arthritis between there. And stage three is arthritis between the capitate and lunate as well. So just thought I'll show the, what's in the scaphoid first. On the scaphoid, well, repositioning the patient's hand into radial deviation with slight wrist flexion. Next, the clinician will release the force on the scaphoid, trying to identify either a thud or click present. If a thud or click is present, this is indicative of a subtle station at the scaphoid indicating a positive test. So that essentially means that the sca scaphoid is subluxating out of the scaphoid fossa, um, proving that the, the scaphoid-lunate joint is unstable. So again, uh, conservative management for this disease is um, typically in mild disease, so stage one, early stages, and that's for non-steroidals as well as wrist splinting. Uh, some papers have described corticosteroid injections, but um, there's no real evidence for it. It's purely pain relief. And again, the operative um, techniques in stage one can be a radial styloidectomy because the arthritis is restricted to that area. But in stage two uh, and stage three, as before with the snack wrist, the options are proximal row carpectomy, scaphoid excision, and a full corner fusion or wrist fusion. I just thought I'll mention the pediatric population quickly. So the scaphoid develops in via enchondral ossification. So typically it starts ossifying at about four or five years of age and stops ossifying at about 13 to 15 years of age, depending on gender. And so the fracture, fractures at different stages on the timeline behave differently. And it's important to use the bone age of the patient, not the chronological age, um, to, in order to um, assess this fracture and manage it appropriately. The Darienzo classification has been described um, where type 1 is seen in kids less than 8 years of age and it's a purely chondral fracture, only seen in MRI, you don't pick it up on x-rays. And type 2 is an osteochondral fracture and type 3 is similar to adult fractures and this is seen in patients over the age of 12. And compared to 15% of adult wrist fractures having a scaphoid fracture, only 3% of all hand and wrist fractures in paediatrics um, have a scaphoid fracture. The fracture location typically is a distal pole, accounting for more than 70%, compared to in an adult population about 65% being at the waist, and a proximal pole fracture is extremely rare. The majority are managed conservatively, and, um, and a JOS review says that even in delayed diagnosis, kids progress to union with adequate immobilization for an appropriate length of time. There's The only indications for surgery is usually kids who are nearing skeletal maturity, and in displaced fractures, and non-union rate is very, very rare at about 0.8%. And at that point, if there's surgical management with wires or even percutaneous screws with bone graft, they progress on to 100% union. And the sequelae of non-union is extremely rare as well. So in summary, the scaphoid has precarious blood supply and therefore fr um, fractures offer a management dilemma. Early detection and immobilization is important for progression to union and a below elbow cast is sufficient. Acute displaced fractures benefit from fixation um, and a headless compression screw is sufficient at the acute setting. In non-union of scaphoid fractures, um, this can lead to significant morbidity and so there's growing evidence to suggest plating offers superior rotational stability over um, a screw fixation, but there isn't currently sufficient trials or evidence in real life settings in patients. And scaphoid fracture in pediatric population behave differently um, and they are very unlikely to need surgery. Thank you.